So good afternoon all, welcome. Uh, as the scientific coordinator of the Center for Philosophy of Science of the University of Lisbon, it is my pleasure to welcome you all and to open this session that will be the second session of the, our center, research center webinars. Um, today's speaker will be Jean Pinheiro. I guess that most of all, if not all, I know him, but uh, nevertheless, let me just record some, some recall some, 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 some parts of uh, Joan's uh, CV. Well, it, this is not part of Joan's CV, but uh, I have to say that Joan is a very good old friend. Uh, he is uh, our member, my personal friend and, my, and the friend of the research center. He is our member since at least 2015. Um, and he worked as part of the research group on philosophy of natural sciences. He was our master student and now he's doing his PhD in Bristol under the supervision of Samir Okasha. Mm -hmm. We will record John's communication and only that. So the, the, part, the, the questions and the answers will, will not uh, record. And um, what, is the, what is the idea? The idea is that uh, we are thinking of creating a YouTube channel in the future with, uh, we'll, where we'll place these uh, record sessions if they went well, Joao. Well, if, if your presentation is good enough, maybe we can put it as part of our YouTube channel. So behave. Okay, so uh, best of, uh, I, I, I'm hope that the communication will be great. I'm pretty sure there will be, it will be. And I will just shut up and give the word, the floor to Sylvia. Sylvia. Hello, everybody. Welcome here to this webinar. Um, Joan will speak for uh, 45 minutes, more or less, and then we will have a Q&A uh, session. For the Q&A, please uh, just write, just write in, the, in the chat that you want to, to ask something. And I will call um, the people in the order of the so as they register in, in the chat. Um, so just in case this should not happen, but just in case uh, the um, the connection fall, if you are um, shut off uh, the uh, this Zoom meeting, just log in again through the link and password we we sent you uh, at the beginning. Uh, this shouldn't happen, but uh, we already had uh, strange experiences, even if we are using uh, Colibri. So uh, this is it. Um, Joan, please. Um, so, uh, can you see my presentation, the PowerPoint presentation? Yeah. Okay. Just minimizing you guys. Right. Yeah, so um, for those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm doing a PhD on the natural foundations of uh, global moral and political philosophy. In particular, I'm developing an evolutionary ethics, which I hope will help me adjudicate on some contemporary debates about uh, the tenability of fair inclusive moral projects, namely those of cosmopolitanism. And this research uh, will I, I hope, uh, enter into a chapter of that dissertation. So today I'm here to tell you about this, the promises and pitfalls of cooperation-centered approaches to morality. I'll begin by introducing uh, the cooperation-centered theory, uh, in particular, these two core hypotheses uh, of the theory. The one is meta-ethical. Then I'll cover some of the promises of, uh, of the theory. In particular, I'll tell you that um, uh, it makes a few predictions which uh, apparently uh, borne out truth on uh, cross-cultural analysis. Uh, this indicates interpretationist hypothesis, or so they claim. The hypothesis is good for more realists uh, in that it helps them to rebuild a uh, famous evolutionary debunking argument. All great with the theory. So I'll present you some of its uh, incompletenesses first, uh, because there's simply a few um, moral phenomena which the theory apparently cannot explain, at least at the first, at the first glance. Uh, and then I'll um, quickly browse uh, an inconsistency 
uh, which I found in the theory. And I'll consider a possible way out of that ecosystem. Maybe, just maybe, might help cover for those anomalies as well. Right, so first things first, I'll begin by introducing the cooperation in the theory. Uh, so all of this debate uh, really the agreement that the moral sense of selection. In moral sense, I mean cognitive and we might have moral oh is unstable. So all this discussion that I'm about to have, um, let me set the timer off again. Um, right. All this discussion I'm about to have uh, depends on us agreeing on uh, on the following that our moral sense evolved by natural selection. And by moral sense, I mean this moral cognitive and cognitive dispositions we might have. Uh, there's a standard argument in the literature why you should believe that morality evolved by natural selection. And this is that the uh, complex behaviors, moral behaviors that we observe cannot really be accounted for, at least presently, by any other sort of explanation for what they came to be the way they are. Um, so this means people in the literature have been on the uh, evolutionary explanatory thesis form, which states that evolutionary forces may accurately explain uh, certain capacities and tendencies associated with moral thinking, feeling, and behavior, and may explain or partly explain some of the content of our moral thought as well, uh, say for feeling and behavior, so far as it is influenced by those evolutionary tendencies. So there's, you'll find more or less uh, um, moderate uh, versions of this thesis, but this is kind of uh, uh, the groundwork for all that follows. So moral science, uh, is now quite old, although still not a mature science or anything like it. Uh, you'll find it in the works of Darwin already, and even before him. And as of Darwin already, people uh, began studying uh, morality by focusing on behaviors uh, related to cooperation. So David Solon, uh, Wilson, for instance, thinks that behaviors motivated by our moral sense and enforced by cultural moral norms are always, he believes, elements of cooperation strategies. Notably reciprocity strategies, though I should say uh, not always reciprocity strategies. They're always kind of cooperative arrangements they, they get into. And that solved problems arising from unbridled self interest. So, the big explanation that must be given according to this framework is an explanation for why we evolved biological altruism, which we define as this um, behavior of organisms that uh, benefits others uh, but comes at the cost of themselves. So this is uh, this was for uh, a long time um, quite a a puzzle for evolutionary traditions to explain how, how it evolved. But we now have some explanations. Uh, importantly, of course, uh, uh, you recognize that we do do so plenty of time behave altruistic in this fashion. Uh, it might be in our interest to steal something, for instance, but we we find ourselves prevented from stealing or do something else that would uh, be considered uh, free writing on other people's cooperation because we recognize these moral norms as uh, authoritative and binding in such a way that uh, we shouldn't actually uh, uh, behave. So. A possible explanation for this, this is a very common just a story uh, told in the literature, is that most of moral cognition evolved or a whole moral cognition evolved as some would have it uh, during mid to late uh, Pleistocene or early Holocene uh, human evolution, where altruistic dispositions would have conferred advantages to one tribe. Uh, this is because in virtue of uh, morally driven sorts of behaviors, groups would register higher average fitness values compared to less cooperative groups. So think if you are going through um, a really harsh uh, um, a season, and if your group is uh, really good at uh, uh, dividing labor, uh, finding shorts, and, uh, um, and then dividing um, uh, all that they reap from, um, what, what happened? Okay. Uh, all that they reap from those uh, harvests or, or whatever, uh, your group will fare a lot better than those that uh, don't behave in, in such a way. Uh, so 
in order to make this a bit more intuitive to you, consider this visual model. We begin with the population of just cooperators, C. And in the meantime, for some odd reason, this funny genetic mutation enters the population and one of these cooperators becomes a defector. It doesn't actually have to be a genetic uh, mutation, by the way. It could uh, occur if uh, the behavior uh, is owed to uh, a new cultural variant being introduced in the, in the population. It might be introduced because um, um, it is a product of uh, the agent's uh, cognitive innovation or else because the agent decided to copy this behavior from a uh, um, you know, it, it witnessed a, behave, a behavior in a nearby population person and decides to cope it. And why? Perhaps because it, this agent noticed that the behavior was very fitness enhancing and considered why it is fitness enhancing. This defector will be now reaping uh, quite effectively the benefits of everyone else's cooperation while giving nothing in return. So it will have our utility or fitness if you want to uh, adopt the game theoretical or evolutionary game theoretical. Uh, terminology respectively. So according to Fisher's theorem, we'll see that the representation of this fit behavior will be increasing over time. So all these defectors in now this third block uh, uh, will have a higher fitness compared to the other cooperators in the group. And in the long, in the long haul, or perhaps a bit faster if the process is cultural, uh, we'll end up with a population of just defectors. The fun thing to observe is that there is declining average fitness for this population uh, for as long as it happens. So what these theories are saying then is that morality evolves to prevent this from happening, right? So quite intuitive to understand this way, I think. Um, this is an old hypothesis, to be fair. Uh, it has been present at least ex ex in explicit terms since uh, Piotr Kropotkin's mutual aid. In the very last paragraph of the work, he says that in the practice of mutual aid, which we can retrace to the earliest beginnings of evolution, we thus find the positive and the doubted origin of our ethical conceptions. Something along these lines was also present in Darwin, although Darwin didn't put uh, the emphasis on uh, cooperation as being foundational to his theory. He rather focused on something uh, which uh, uh, he, he got from Humean and Smithian theorizing which he calls uh, sympathy or love, which he thinks evolves from animal social instincts. So the social team is still there, but cooperation is not uh, um, a strong uh, uh, a topic, uh, you'd say. This kind of, um, of uh, research has been the most prolific, uh, and not just in the study of moral evolution, but uh, in active search for homologous behaviors in, uh, in uh, capuchin monkeys and chimpanzees by Sarah Brosnan and Franz de Baal, for instance. Uh, if we do combine with such a uh, homologist, then there's all the more evidence, uh, all the more evidence to believe that this might be uh, actual adaptations. So the adaptationist hypothesis that is at the core center of uh, uh, cooperation uh, centered theories, uh, uh, sorry, that is at the core of cooperation centered theories, is, uh, is this morality evolved by natural selection for increasing the benefits of social living by promoting cooperation. So, some people think a multi level model of selection applies to explain how cooperation evolved. Some people think actually we should stick to a kin selection based model. Some other people uh, believe a group uh, selection model should be given the emphasis. But all these people, uh, despite the divergences, they can agree on this more general abstract phrasing of, uh, of the theory. Further to this, if you believe in the etiological theory of biological function, which describes functions based on the natural history of a, of a, of a trait, then you could claim that the function of morality is to promote cooperation, the biological function, that is. So, so much for the adaptationist hypothesis. I want to now introduce the methodical hypothesis. Um, it, it was uh, basically the result of asking a question much like this one. So if evolutionary forces at least partially explain the contents of our moral beliefs and sentiments, as per the modest evolutionary explanatory thesis that we started with, and in particular, if the adaptationist hypothesis that we just saw is correct, how does moral evolution relate to the truth value of our beliefs? One uh, answer 
came from the realist school. More realism is uh, arguably the most common metaphysical thesis uh, you can find. It's, it's, it is, uh, there are many formulations of it, but generally speaking, uh, people tend to agree on these three, uh, three theses that uh, there are more beliefs and these are propositional, meaning that they do get truth values. And uh, they get these truth values because there do actually exist these moral facts uh, which confirm uh, truth values. And we can know this uh, quite objectively because they are independent from the agent's evaluative attitudes. Uh, so if you believe, for instance, that, uh, I don't know, um, you should not harm innocent children, something like that. The, real, the realist will tell you that is true because there is a fact that makes it so. And these facts, according to naturalism, will be natural facts. Uh, so we can explain or reduce or ground, depending on how uh, your strain of naturalism uh, is phrased, uh, in terms of natural facts. That we can determine, if you take on, on board this broad philosophical naturalism, we can and should actually determine them uh, a posteriori. And this is where the adaptationist hypothesis uh, comes to enter, uh, the meta-realism. And uh, maybe uh, you already have some idea of what follows. If you combine the adaptationist hypothesis with this sort of naturalism, then this is what follows. The mathematical hypothesis, which I'm calling cooperation-centered moral naturalism, which states that moral truths are grounded or explained or reduced, however you want it, in fact, about, uh, in fact, about uh, cooperation or sociability. This is uh, this grounded on uh, or grounded in, grounded on. I think it should be grounded on, right? I think this might be a typo here. Anyway, this uh, uh, terminology is, uh, sorry, this phrasing of uh, the position is owed to Kim Sterling and Ben Fraser. Uh, ben Fraser, unfortunately, no longer does uh, philosophy at all. Uh, you can also find it in the, in the work of uh, David Wong. Uh, for, it might be the person defending this for the longest, uh, so far as I'm aware. Although he defends his hypothesis as a part of a larger theory that incorporates other hypotheses, Ken Pinmore uh, thinks this applies uh, to justice, uh, although not to morality as a whole, uh, least of all to ethics, which includes even further stuff, arguably. David Kopp, until 2007, I think, uh, he was proposing a version of this hypothesis without the evolutionary grounding. Since 2007, he has uh, since started to making this. Uh, this move. Uh, Oliver Scott Curry, we'll get to him in, in a moment. And I decided to mention just another one, Herbert Gintis, uh, because Gintis, uh, along with a lot, a lot of people doing work on the adaptationist hypothesis, actually, uh, they tacitly agree to this meta uh, ethical hypothesis, but they never clearly quite formulate it nor explore its implications. But this is just to say that there's actually a lot of people that are non philosophers. Uh, and do end up uh, phrasing this in their scientific work. Uh, that's why we're here. We need to point this out and uh, say why it's a problem or not. So if you take this hypothesis on board, then roughly what you're saying is that uh, a moral belief truth value depends on its promoting cooperative behaviors, which are good according to the theory. So if you further bear in mind uh, the empirical hypothesis and the biofunctional hypothesis, I, I I, I, I suggested earlier, then arguably these moral naturalists can cogently argue for the naturalization of moral normativity on functional grounds. Now, you, you might not like this. You might think that there's more to moral normativity than a functional account can uh, explain. Uh, I would disagree, but this is an issue uh, to discuss later. I'm not uh, going to focus on criticisms of moral naturalism uh, in this uh, presentation. I will mention some criticisms, but they will apply to the combination of these two hypotheses in particular uh, and not to other kind of naturalisms. So just to uh, make clear, uh, these are the two theses which are at the core of the cooperation-centered cooperation uh, theory. The adaptationist hypothesis, which uh, to go over just once more, it, st it states that morality evolved by natural selection for increasing the benefits of social living by promoting cooperation. So again, you may, you, you may get different cooperation centered theories, depending on how you cash out this, uh, like uh, uh, the, depending on the specific, just so story you, you tell us about how morality evolved, 
where it, it evolved mostly by kin selection, et cetera. But we can all agree in this abstract formulation. So same thing about the meta-ethical hypothesis. You might disagree about uh, how you are to understand the specific uh, explanation of uh, moral truths in terms of uh, facts about cooperation, but you still you will you will still agree that moral th truths are indeed grounded on facts about cooperation. Uh, so so much for uh, the introduction of the cooperation centered theory. Now I want to tell you a little bit more about uh, why this looks so promising. In particular, I'll 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 tell you uh, first why the empirical hypothesis, the adaptationist hypothesis. Is uh, uh, looks so promising, and then I'll I'll tell you a bit about why the ethical the ethical hypothesis also looks promising. Uh, so let's start with the uh, with empirical one. So Sharon Street um, tried to figure out which sorts of uh, facts could actually relate positively with uh, moral beliefs, which we typically take to be true, and uh, behaving a behavior that uh, follows from those behaviors. Uh, from those beliefs being a simple answer. And she came up with a list. Uh, so I'm calling it the list, uh, the streets list of adaptive moral facts, although she actually doesn't believe that such facts exist, which is why I'm uh, leaving the. So consider the first. Uh, here I like it in blue. So number two, the fact that something would promote the interests of a family member is a reason to do it. So according to the cooperation center theory, that would be true because we can explain this in cooperative terms. And such a fact would then be a cooperative fact. And I'll believe that promoting the interests of the family uh, would be a justified moral belief according to the theory. Uh, we can give a sim similar treatment for all these other uh, elements uh, in blue. So we have greater obligations to help our own children. Uh, so maybe let me rephrase this. So uh, the fact that we have children will make it, will will give us reason to think we have greater obligations towards our children than strangers. I guess that would be a good rephrase. Um, the fact that someone has treated one well is a reason to treat that person well in return. So we can account for this with uh, uh, Robert Rivers' um, uh, direct and indirect reciprocity theory, for instance, for the evolution of cooperation. The same for uh, number five. But it's not enough that we do this we need to actually verify that all of morality will uh, similarly be, be considered to be good uh, because it's cooperative. Uh, Oliver Scott Curry, Daniel Austin Mullins, and RV Whitehouse uh, from Oxford, they took it into their own hands to try and show this to be the case. Uh, uh, in this uh, study published uh, last year, so what they did was first list, um, this might be very small letters for you to read, but uh, just take my word for it. So they took all these examples of uh, typical moral behaviors. So for example, uh, being a loving mother, being a protective mother, these have to do with helping family members. And it turns out we can explain this uh, kind of behavior as advantageous if you use a keen selection theory for how uh, cooperation evolves. Uh, something other from the list. So working together in a team or coordinating your behavior with others. So these uh, are behaviors which have to do with helping group members and uh, they don't have to be your kin at all. And we can explain why this sort of uh, behavior evolved again with signaling, signaling game theory, uh, first proposed by Lewis in conventions and then properly developed uh, uh, mathematically uh, with the tools of evolutionary game theory by Brian Skirms and, uh, and so on. Uh, so when it comes to uh, some other examples, trusting someone with returning a favor, paying a debt, then we can uh, explain this with Robert Rivers' theory of direct indirect reciprocity, which I had just mentioned uh, a minute ago or so, and, 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 and so on. So they, they divided this into different uh, categories, seven of them, and they can all be currently, at least, uh, um, accounted for in uh, evolution of cooperative cooperation models. So next step is to see whether when these behaviors occur, whether people uh, will think they are good. And the way they did so was to study the occurrence of these behaviors in 60 different societies and see if the moral balance being ascribed to these behaviors 
uh, was a positive one. They picked this sixty societies because this allows them to avoid this kind of weird bias, by which I mean a Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic bias that you typically get, uh, unfortunately, in a lot of sociology studies where the population of study is uh, basically undergrads at the university, and they are usually Western educated, etc. So they went into the human relation uh, area files, which is this really huge archive where very detailed descriptions of uh, behaviors uh, of these uh, different societies are kept. They have since been digitalized, so it's now very easy to access them. And they basically uh, went on to the category that describes the moral behaviors of these societies. And they analyzed the paragraphs and saw whether those behaviors that uh, could be explained in terms of helping kin, helping group, reciprocating, etc., were being given uh, a moral balance uh, by, those, uh, by the members of those societies. And it turns out, sorry, <clears throat> it turns out that yes, uh, except in one case, there was a thief, so disrespecting property, but it turns out even in this case, they could actually explain the behavior of this thief uh, because he was being brave. He was actually behaving a bit like Robin Hood at that time. And that was considered uh, morally good because it, it was actually doing something overall considered uh, fair or something. I can't remember the exact explanation they gave us, but they could explain it. So the result of this study is that the predictions of the cooperation centered theory, <clears throat> that wasn't enough. <coughs> ah, yeah, COVID. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> so the result of the study <clears throat> was that the predictions of the theory uh, borne out true. When we have cooperative behavior, people do tend to think that's uh, what we should do. And they conclude that uh, the cooperative account has the potential to provide anthropology with the unified theory of morality that it has hitherto lacked. Right. Uh, yeah, so, so much for uh, saying good things about the adaptationist hypothesis. Uh, and I want to tell you why the meta-ethical hypothesis also seems to be very uh, fruitful. And for that, I'm going to focus on the specific arguments against realism. They are evolutionary debunking arguments, or as people sometimes call them, Darwinian dilemmas. Uh, and obviously, the most famous of them would be uh, Sharon Street. But there are a lot more, much older. Um, but for some reason, Strait's one uh, made the impact in the literature. She asks us to, uh, well, she, she tells that, to, um, sorry, she, um, she suggests that the moral realist has two hypotheses. And I think she's right, there's only these two. Uh, so there is, either there is no relation between evolutionary influences on our ev evaluative attitudes and independent evaluative truths, or there is a relationship. Uh, so for instance, uh, I could rephrase this by saying like, either uh, we do indeed track moral truths and in virtual, in virtual of tracking them, uh, we get fitness enhancing moral behaviors or we don't. So if there is no relation, uh, then we get the skeptical result that most of our evaluative judgments are off track due to distorting pressure of Darwinian forces. It would be a matter of cosmic coincidence if we had evolved a uh, moral uh, cognition that does not track truth, but somehow, despite having evolved for not tracking truth, still tracks truth somehow. That would be quite a cosmic coincidence, she thinks, and I think she's right. And if there is a relation, well, is that even an option really? She thinks it's not an acceptable option because it's not really scientific. It, it, it fails on parsimony because it posits the existence of this truth which she claims we don't really need in order to explain how morality evolved. So as a consequence, uh, epistemic moral realism is on a bad standing. Now, I wanna say that the meta metaethical hypothesis of the cooperation centered theory of morality allows us to basically follow on the tracking thesis and claim that it's actually quite persimonious. And this is what I'm gonna show uh, next. But it's, it's, quite, it's quite easy to understand why. Um, so if you take on the naturalistic route, uh, then you need to account for what is the nature of those facts. 
So what kind of natural effects are we talking about? And exactly why did it promote reproductive success to track them? Uh, the naturalists can certainly try to develop answers to these questions, but at least on the face of things, the prospects appear dim. And indeed, it is the realist or the naturalist burden of proof to show how tracking a certain kind of natural moral effects promoted fitness. But if the adaptationist hypothesis is true, and you don't even need the meta-ethical hypothesis so far, but if the adaptationist hypothesis is true, we know that there are objective facts about the practices and norms that would promote stable cooperation. In fact, we can study them uh, with quite a, a mathematical objectivity if you deploy the tools of evolutionary game theory, for instance. The way we do this in studying morality is uh, by equating the payoffs of uh, agents' interactions with fitness values. And uh, the strategies that is uh, actors, uh, agents, uh, perform uh, with behaviors that will accord to moral norms. And doing so, we can test which uh, moral behaviors uh, reap the most benefits in game theoretical settings. Uh, so there are, um, yeah, um, so there are typically uh, within this literature uh, five uh, mechanisms that would explain how cooperation evolved. They're very well uh, understood these days and even better. Like the, the science is advancing at an incredible speed. It's actually even quite difficult to keep up with it. Uh, but we, we now have analytic solutions for when uh, this mechanism can indeed promote evolution of cooperation. Uh, so you need to, well, yeah, I don't need to lose too much time here. All I need to say, all you need to understand here without getting into the mathematics is that we do have objective facts about that. Now, Stritz is entirely correct that in saying that Epistemic rules for inferences to the best explanation dictate that one is to pick the lowest of alternative explanations to follow the, the, the terminology of Peter Lipton. But if the cooperation center theory is correct, then we know that moral facts are grounded on these very objective facts about what promotes cooperation. So the simple model embodies the lesson that tracking fitness and tracking truth are not alternatives. Increases in fitness are actually being explained by successful truth tracking and reductions in fitness by fa failures in truth tracking. So truth tracking and fitness tracking are complementary rather than alternative explanations, such that we may safely, we may, uh, one may safely uh, infer both. And if you worry about inflation, inflating your meta-ethics, well, if this cooperation center theory is correct, you don't need to inflate anything at all, unless you don't believe there are indeed objective facts about what promotes cooperation in the first place. So more realism is safe from Darwin the Darwin dilemma, if the cooperation center theory holds. So in sum, the cooperation center theory is compatible with, compatible with the naturalism, makes testable and verified predictions, enjoys the objectivity of mathematics, can save moral realism from the Darwinian dilemma. And that's all very good. Uh, but there seem to be still some limits to uh, how the theory goes. And I'm going to focus on uh, two pitfalls, as I would call them. Um, one of them has to do with this uh, anomalous phenomenon. I call them anomalous because uh, they're anomalous in the sense that the theory cannot explain them, such that uh, the existence of these anomalies suggests that the theory must be incomplete. And then I, uh, at, at least the meta, uh, sorry, at least the empirical uh, hypothesis is incomplete. Um, and therefore, consequently, the mathematical. And then I'll, I'll give you, I'll suggest another problem, sorry, that will show the two hypotheses to be inconsistent between them. So remember that we covered this uh, list of adaptive moral facts. I purposely, uh, purposefully left uh, these two out uh, because there is nothing obvious about them that could be said in cooperative terms. The fact that something would promote one's survival is a reason in favor of it. All very well, but what has cooperation to do with this? The fact that someone has done one deliberate harm is a reason to shun the person or, or seek his or her punishment. So again, uh, what is it that we can, what is there to be said about harm uh, that can be reduced to an explanation in terms of cooperation? It's very unclear. And it seems that uh, Oliver Scott Curry and his pals are actually quite uh, aware of this problem. In their study of the human relational area files, they did not look, for instance, for the moral balance being attributed to 
uh, non-cooperative behaviors. Uh, I mean, non-cooperative, not in the sense that they are defective, but in the sense that they really have nothing to do with, uh, uh, with cooperation. Perhaps I should say a cooperative. I, anyway, uh, consider, for instance, when Curry says that it remains to be seen whether the theory can be extended to provide cooperative explanations of other moral phenomena, including those encountered in this ethnographic review. And he gives us uh, a few examples, industry and laziness, truth telling and honesty, chastity and fidelity, and the list goes on. Uh, now, uh, it seems like, at least to me, that this paper by Curry uh, et al. suffers from a bit of confirmation bias because they recognize this phenomenon to exist, but they still go on to argue uh, for the completeness and the unifying potential of a theory uh, without having shown it. Uh, in fact, when you go look, uh, when you look onto the very definition of ethics in the human relation area files, you find a lot more examples that go along these lines. So I decided to start concocting this list of reported counterexamples to the theory of morality as cooperation. There are counterexamples uh, in the sense that, at least uh, at the first glance, they have nothing to do with cooperation. And that's the only sense in which they are purported anomalies. Uh, so consider this. Uh, personal autonomy. Um, what would be the difference, for instance, uh, between a righteousness, uh, uh, sorry, between a, a fair dictator uh, and a, an otherwise just fair scheme of cooperation? If we cannot differentiate the fair dictator uh, or the fair dictatorship from a fair scheme of cooperation uh, that is not dictatorial, then there is nothing that the cooperative uh, theory can tell us about uh, preferring morally one to the other. Phenomena of authenticity, phenomena of uh, adaptive preference formation, promises to oneself, moral virtues, values like purity, values related to sex, obligations towards future generations, inalienable rights and intrinsic values are almost the full totality of non anthropocentric animal and environmental ethics, aesthetic dimensions of worthwhile lives, treatment of the dead, religious values considered, for instance, uh, in the secrecy of cows. How are we to explain that in cooperative terms? And you can probably add more examples to this list. Uh, so feel free to um, give me some examples. These are not all my examples, of course. Uh, some of these uh, e examples uh, already occur in uh, Wong, Buchanan and Powell, for instance, Bloom uh, and other places. But, but we can definitely do more to extend this, uh, this list. So I've given previously, I think maybe two presentations uh, along similar lines of this one. And because I don't have time to cover all these examples, what I do in each presentation is pick up different examples and just explore a little bit. So I pick it, I've picked up for this explanation, those highlighted in red. So I'm gonna give you one example of values related to sex and another one related to environmental ethics and explore to which extent they can be considered uh, putative anomalies to the theory. So let me begin by telling that uh, the obvious thing that the cooperation center theorists should do is to try to show that this phenomenon can actually be explained in terms of cooperation, although uh, it might not look like it at first. So consider uh, trying to give a cooperative account of uh, why we do have strong moral intuitions uh, about incest. Uh, so Curry suggests, for instance, that perhaps sexual morals are solutions to the problems of cooperation recurrent in human sexual life. And they should view sexual morality as cooperation about sex. So the example would be uh, for explaining incest that in breathing as deleterious effects on reproductive fitness um, of kin. And this would be something that arguably we can explain uh, in terms of a, corporate, of a model of um, evolution of cooperation, which is uh, uh, based on kin selection theory or inclusive fitness theory or something like that. Now, this might very well be uh, true. Uh, having deleterious effects um, would be considered as a uh, um, non-cooperative uh, uh, solution and it would come at a, a cost uh, to both uh, if the uh, kin selection theory is correct. So uh, arguably the cooperation center theory can then explain uh, with the help of its uh, adaptationist hypothesis, uh, why we do have this strong moral intuitions about incest. But it is not, 
entirely obvious to me what it should say, however, about the truth of these moral intuitions. And this is for the simple reason that, at least today, we do have in vitro fertilization, uh, abortion, uh, powerful contraceptives, very effective ones, such that these concerns about the deleterious effects uh, of incestual relations uh, no longer make sense. Uh, so I don't know what um, what uh, Curry and Talia want to tell about this, want to say about this. Perhaps there is a, a cultural uh, model that would still uh, make it prohibitive somehow, but these are just some concerns that they need to explore and that are yet to uh, be made sense of, uh, to, to, have been, uh, to have been uh, explained, um, to have been explained. Right, uh, another example I want to bring to you is uh, has to do with the uh, environment. Uh, this thought experiment is called the last man because in it there is the last man on earth. All other humans have, uh, for some reason that doesn't really matter to us here, disappeared. Uh, this fellow can decide whether to trigger a doomsday device that will virtually annihilate all life on earth after he dies or just not press that trigger. So should he or should he not? Now, the majority of people have this strong intuition that he shouldn't really. But how is it that the uh, cooperation-centered theory can explain it? Uh, both the empirical and the mathematical hypothesis seem to fail here, as there are no humans left to cooperate after the last man's death. Unless you want to inflate the theory a little bit more, and perhaps other organisms' cooperation is morally good too, but this might have uh, some contributive uh, consequences. Uh, at least my intuition tells me that surely not all forms of cooperation are moral. Uh, would the synergism between, say, um, so yeah, so there is this uh, uh, consequence which seems to be a very counterintuitive one that uh, if cooperation of other organisms is morally good, then even the cooperation between algae and cyanobacteria uh, would be really good. And this is at least the uh, I don't know, it, it might be something you want to take on board. To me, it sounds a bit counterintuitive, but who knows? Um, right, so and now I want to pass on to um, uh, problems for the consistency between the both the uh, empirical, the, the, the adaptationist, and the mathematical stance. And the inconsistency, I think, can best be revealed by focusing on this particular moral phenomenon of parochial altruism. So parochial altruism, uh, it's basically the term we give to all altruism that extends solely to or privileges only one's own group, however defined along uh, social identity markers like um, uh, those of ethnicity or religion or nationality. Really, what have you defining your group of belongs? Uh, in particular, I'm interested in the possibility of antagonistic parochial altruism. So in 2007, Choi and Paul, they put up a model for how morality evolved while trying to mimic uh, those conditions of our uh, environments of, uh, uh, of selection. Um, so they came up with this uh, game theoretical and agent-based simulation conclusions that showed that uh, in order for parochialism or even to evolve, uh, we would have needed uh, intergroup conflict. So this, I think, uh, is a very debated uh, hypothesis about how morality actually evolved. I don't need anything that strong. I don't need it to be a set conflict between groups in order for morality to evolve. All I need in order for my problem of inconsistency to arise is for large-scale intergroup cooperation to more easily evolve or to be strongly facilitated if antagonism uh, between uh, groups or towards our group members does occur. And this we know to be true, irrespectively of whether this particular gesture story is correct. Um, it is quite possible uh, on consideration on, for, of, for instance, warfare resulting between uh, group competition for limited available resources where the groups, even if it is, or, or even in, indirectly, if uh, um, the group that will cooperate uh, the best, again, will, uh, will do better. 
and because the resources are limited, you can't really share with everyone. So you, you'll, you'll be doing a lot better if you just share with the members. So I don't know how much you heard about this. <laughs> so what I was saying is that, so there is a phenomenon uh, called parochial altruism, which is altruism that extends solely to or privileges only one's own group, however you define it. And some people have suggested that altruism or parochial altruism can only evolve if uh, they promote group conflict. So I don't want to lose too much time now with this. Uh, um, I'm just going to say that I don't need it to be true that uh, conflict between groups is necessary. Uh, it's only necessary for there to be any consistency between the two hypotheses that uh, there being such antagonism does make it easier for large scale intergroup cooperation to evolve. And it seems to be the case that it, we know that in warfare, uh, people um, get to get to get into groups a lot more and uh, morality uh, does lead to greater cohesion, et cetera, et cetera. And this is enough for me. Uh, and just so you know, uh, this is uh, one other uh, ethnographic study of uh, only six societies in this case. Uh, it's a very small size population of 237 adults. Uh, this, uh, um, the results of this study uh, show that uh, we do indeed behave um, in parochial ways, such that uh, we judge uh, actions to be less bad, for instance, if they occur at a greater temporal distance or spatial distance from our group, or if uh, uh, authoritative uh, elements of our group uh, judge them to be less bad uh, and we don't have the same um, uh, responses if uh, uh, other authoritative figures from other groups do so. So parochial altruism is indeed a phenomenon, it does exist, uh, it's, but the, whether the, the antagonistic uh, hypothesis that it can only evolve um, sorry, that parochial altruism can only evolve if there, if there are antagonisms. We don't need that. But the fact that such antagonisms do promote cooperation raises an inconsistency because the mathematical hypothesis tells us that it's always good to cooperate. So if the underlying moral criterion remains that does this behavior promote cooperation? Or if one must hold that cooperating supporting institutions are morally good, then institu institutionalized warfare, for instance, uh, would be good according to the mathematical, the mathematical hypothesis, uh, or at least, sorry, it would, be, it would be good or congenial to the evolution uh, of cooperation according to the adaptationist hypothesis, not to the mathematical hypothesis, sorry, according to the adaptationist hypothesis. And this is where the problem arises because um, the mathematical hypothesis, insofar as it is grounded on the adaptationist one, then it must conclude that antagonism is good. And this would uh, be inconsistent. So there's some attempts at solving this uh, problem in the work of uh, Oliver Scott Curry. Um, he realizes this and he thinks there must be some trade-off uh, between uh, uh, cooperating with our group or, or the next. And at any given moment, uh, something should settle what we should do, and it thinks that a form of cooperative behavior will be considered morally bad when it is pursued at the expense of some other larger form of cooperation. So this is the criterion. I think the criterion introduced is very ad hoc. Uh, why would the larger form of cooperation always be preferable? Very, uh, a very gratuitous explanation. It, it's not even clear what a larger form of cooperation is. Perhaps, quite arguably, the trade-off he mentions is a fitness trade-off. But if a fitness trade-off uh, is what is at stake, uh, as you would suppose, uh, given the adaptationist hypothesis and the framing of theory, evolutionary game theoretical models, and so on, uh, then sometimes parochial altruism will be rational, and, and including the antagonistic ones, and inconsistency would remain. 
So perhaps at times it would be good to uh, rob a bank. This is the, the example he gives us to show that uh, we should prefer the larger form of cooperation, which is to rob a bank, according to him. But the larger payoff doesn't have to be, um, sorry, not to rob a bank would be the larger payoff, according to him. But it, it doesn't have to be at all. Uh, so I think there's other reasons to consider that it is actually a fitness trade-off that is at stake here. Uh, consistence with his view, he says in another uh, extract from the same paper, our impression of the source material, so of these human relational files that they scoped for uh, confirmation to their theory, was that in some societies, family appeared to trump group. In our societies, it was the other way around. So there seems to be a trade-off indeed. And morality as cooperation would predict that this was partly because in our sample of societies, cooperative interactions with kin and group and I status individuals occurred more frequently or confer greater uh, benefits. Uh, so parochial altruism is being favored. Uh, but this only would only rec recapitulate the definitionist claim, allowing for antagonistic moral parochialism, which would in turn reintroduce inconsistency, given that the metaethical hypothesis says that you should always cooperate. I think there might be a way out for this, which just, uh, uh, and the way out is just to inflate the hypothesis a little bit. Uh, it has all to do with these fitness trade-offs as I will show you in a second. So let's begin by questioning, what is the motivation for attempting to reduce everything to cooperation? Earlier, I said that uh, Oliver Scott Curry hints at something. It's that it would be good to have a unified picture of both morality and how morality uh, relates to, to, to moral sciences. But in keeping with this line of thought, and indeed, while well, more generally founding a theory of morality on evolutionary game theory or in some adaptationist hypothesis, something has gone a largely overlooked in the literature, I think. When we claim that the function of morality is to increase the benefits of social living, these really are fitness benefits that we're talking about. And I pressed Curry uh, by email on these issues, and he seems to agree. It tells us that we should choose the option when we have to make those, the, the, those, those choices, when we have the, the trade-off, uh, we should choose the option in the non-zero sum game that leads to the superior equilibrium, which is also what I mean by larger form of cooperation, he explained, which, yes, is certainly cashed out in fitness terms. Now, it so happens that at times, games don't really have zero sums. A cooperative equilibrium may be altogether unavailable due to the very nature of the game. If we are competing for limited resources, for instance, there might simply not be enough to share because you cannot divide the good infinitely and make it fair for everyone. Or perhaps the very nature of the game is of the sort that such a, an equilibrium cannot be obtained because a win-win solution is not possible, say, for instance, uh, in a match of football. With a draw, if, if you draw on football, is it considered a win-win situation? I don't think so, but maybe you can tell me wrong. But anyway, there will be cases in which games by their very nation do not have zero sums. Uh, or cases in which it would simply be better fitness-wise that we do not cooperate. Uh, an equilibrium might not exist always on the side of, on the side of cooperation. Under such conditions, uh, Curry believes and uh, let's be fair with Curry, is still trying to make up his mind on some of these issues. So don't take this too seriously. But Curry believes that nobody is obliged to continue playing a cooperative strategy because he thinks we should not expect people to play out of equilibrium. However, this response sounds a bit odd to me because in saying that you should be free not to cooperate if there is no equilibrium, for instance, and consequently, uh, consequently, we would not be doing the morally right thing according to the theory of morality of cooperation. For this shoot, it's not explained in terms of cooperation at all. It would not be moral, but it would remain nevertheless and somehow superrogatory. So there is a solution for this. It's quite simple. Uh, we should speak of goodness as increasing fitness uh, benefits more generally. And there are some advantages to doing this, which relate to the very anomalies that the theory currently faces. If we think of promoting fitness uh, more generally, then we can easily explain as morally good 
uh, these two conditions that earlier on we left aside, uh, promoting one's survival has all to do with fitness, uh, avoiding harm has all to do with fitness. So we can easily fit this and probably uh, we'll need a, a piecemeal approach to, ex to explore all those anomalies in turn and see if they would hold uh, uh, under such a theory, if they, sorry, if, if they could uh, find an explanation under such a, a inflated theory. Uh, but uh, I think there is some, some uh, reason to, to follow long defined. And I'm going to finish my presentation here. I want to thank you, João Courteville and Silvia, for making this happen. Uh, I want to thank you for your attention and for not going away when my internet connection failed uh, like three times. So what was it? Um, yeah, so thank you all. <laughs>